Hello guys, welcome to my channel Commerce Specialist where you'll find you know videos relating to subjects like financial accounting, financial reporting, management accounting, auditing, financial management, so on and so forth. Guys, if you're new to my channel, please subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon so that you don't miss any important video. Our today's topic is inventory valuation. We'll talk about some basics, inventory valuation systems and methods. So before we go on discussing the inventory valuation system and methods, we need to know what is the meaning of inventory? What do we understand by inventory? Basically, inventory is any item which is either purchased or manufactured for the purpose of selling. Generally, there are three types of inventory. Inventory of raw materials, inventory of work in progress, and inventory of finished good. If you look at inventory of raw material, that means it is available to be used in production. If we talk about inventory of work in progress, to be completed. Why? Because it's in progress, it's incomplete, it's an incomplete form. We need to, you know, complete it further. Inventory of finished goods to be sold, which means the word says it all, finished. Finished means that the inventory is already waiting for its buyer. So if you talk about a furniture manufacturing company, uh, a big uh, company would ideally have three different warehouse. In the first warehouse, you will find inventory of raw material. That could be wood, wooden planks. The second warehouse you will have inventory of work in progress where you will find furniture, uh, could be tables and chairs which are in, uh, you know, incomplete, semi-finished. They're in progress. And in the third warehouse you will find all finished products ready to be sold. So these are three different types of inventories. Now we are talking about inventory valuation. What is the meaning of valuation? Valuation means to value something, to know the value of some item. So our remaining discussion with focus only on inventory of finished goods because that is normally discussed. So assuming I have a small grocery store and at the end of the year, let's say at December 31st, I'm left with 10 tins, 10 tins of cooking oil. Let's say oil. And each tin cost me $10. So I need to know at the year end, what is the value of my closing stock? Very simple, you multiply by the quantity you multiply the quantity by the selling price, the cost of it. So 10 into 10 will give you $100. This is value of ending inventory. Ending inventory you call it, or you can call it value of closing stock. Value in terms of dollars. Quantity 10 uh, tens multiplied by its cost, which is $10. So this is how we get value. Now, the another important question is, why are we interested to, you know, find the value of my closing stock, $100? So there are three important reasons. Valuation of stock will affect our cost of goods sold, 
Close in stock valuation is important to calculate cost of goods sold. Obviously, if it affects cost of goods sold, it will definitely affect the gross profit and finally the net profit. Stock valuation or valuation of closing stock will also affect our current assets, working capital, and obviously total assets. Stock valuation is also important because of generally accepted accounting principles, the gap. One of the principles uh, we discussed in my um, uh, previous video in depreciation, uh, which was matching principle. Matching principle. According to matching principle, all revenues and costs of the of a particular period are to be taken into account in order to calculate profit or loss. So when I say cost, these 10 units which are still unsold should not be the part of cost of goods sold. So if we don't calculate the value of ending inventory, we will not arrive at correct cost. If we don't arrive at correct cost, we will not be following matching principle in true letter and spirit. So these were all three main reasons why we calculate value of closing stock. It affects our statement of financial position. It affects our statement of comprehensive income. And yes, it, is, uh, it helps us to comply with this matching principle requirements. So now let's talk about inventory valuation system. Generally speaking, we have two inventory valuation systems, which are normally in practice the periodic and the perpetual. So when I talk about periodic system, under periodic system, as the name says it, inventory is valued at the end of an accounting period. Now that accounting period could be every month, every quarter, every, uh, semi-annually, or maybe every year. So that's for the business to decide when they want to value their stock. Let's assume I deal in rice. I'm a rice trader. So what I do, I purchase rice and I sell rice. So the whole month I keep buying and selling and at the end of the month, I do my totals. How many kilograms I purchased, how many kilograms I sold and how many kilograms are left. So focusing on how much is left, I will only know at the end of the month because that is the time I value my inventory. So if you ask me in between the month any other day, how much is the value of my closing stock? I cannot give you an answer. Why? Because I've not done the totals. I've not done inventory valuation. If you compare it with perpetual system, in perpetual system, inventory records are updated after every transactions. As soon as a transaction takes place, the inventory records are updated. You can say it's done on an online real-time system. Which means, even in during the month, let's say on the 16th of December, if you ask me what is the value of closing stock now, I can give you an answer. Why? Because my stock accounts are updated, records are updated at all times. But it's not the case with periodic system. We only get to know the value of closing stock at the end of the period. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to make a table here, which will give you like, uh, you know, a summary of comparison between periodic and perpetual system. So guys, summing up, the comparison between periodic and perpetual, I've put them here in four different points. Have a look at the first one. When inventory records are updated, under periodic system, it's updated at the end of the period. Whereas under perpetual system, all inventory records are updated as soon as a transaction takes place, whether that be for a purchase or a sale, even for returns. When we talk about cost of goods sold, under periodic system, cost of goods sold normally is calculated at the end of the period. Whereas in perpetual system, cost of goods sold is, can be calculated after every transaction. When we look at account titles, under periodic system, please note 
we do operate purchase account. That is whenever we buy our goods, whenever we buy our merchandise, we debit the purchase account. But in a periodic system, we do not use the term purchases. In fact, we use an inventory or merchandise account. Whenever we buy goods, whenever we buy stock, we debit either inventory or merchandise account. And then in the end, if we talk about suitability, periodic system normally suits small businesses. Like the example I gave you of a grocery store, I am the owner, I am the proprietor, I buy rice, I sell, and at this uh, end of the period, I do the totals, I look at the value of, I calculate the value of my closing stock. But for bigger businesses, we need different people doing different jobs. And for a big business like Walmart, you need to invest in technology. If you talk about big grocery stores, big supermarket, hypermarkets, at their cash counters, when we buy stuff, you know, they have those barcode readers. They look at those barcode readers, those guns, they put it on the, you know, stock. It fetches the barcode, it transfers the detail to the computer, and through that, the stock accounts are updated. And it also gives accounting data to the system. So if I give you an example, which system to use in your company, periodic or perpetual, you need to look at few things. For example, banks. How their ATM system works. Automated teller machine, you know, when you withdraw money through the ATM. The mechanics behind the software is actually the perpetual system. As soon as a customer either deposits or withdraws money, the bank system, they update their account balance on an online real-time basis. So bank doesn't wait for the whole year, for the whole month to update your account balance, to adjust your account balance. No, as soon as you make a transaction, your account balance is updated. If I talk about a blood bank, assume a person uh, you know, goes in an emergency to a blood bank and asks for two bottles of you know, A negative blood. The blood bank, you know, they cannot tell them, we don't know whether we have it or not. You come after one month, the patient is going to die. So if you're talking about such businesses, where it is very important to know stock level at all times, you have to use perpetual system. But the example I gave you, I'm a rice trader. It doesn't matter if I don't know how many kilograms of rice are there in my warehouse. It's not a matter of life and that, it's fine we can use periodic system. Now next, we are going to look at the methods. So now we are going to talk about inventory evaluation methods. Please understand whether it be periodic or perpetual, each system has three methods in it. So at the moment I'm talking about perpetual system and the very first method, FIFO. FIFO stands for first in, first out. Which means the focus of FIFO method is when we are selling. Whenever we are selling, our priority is to sell the old stock first and the fresh recent stock later. That's the whole idea. So in a uh, perpetual system, first in, first out method, our focus will be to sell the older stock first and the recent stock later. Have a look at this example. I've given some details here. It's a numerical example. Uh, you will understand how FIFO system works. So if you look at the you know, first uh, information given here, January 1st, we have an inventory of 1,000 units. So what you do is you write the date, January 1st, Inventory 1,000 units, you always have to record this in the balance column. This is quantity, 1,000 units. The unit price is $10. You multiply, you get 10,000. This is done. Inventory is recorded. Coming on the next transaction, which is fifth. On fifth, what we are doing? We are buying, we are purchasing 4,000 units at the rate of $11.
So first we recorded here in purchases, uh, you know, columns. Quantity, we are buying 4,000 units. We are buying for $11. You multiply, you get 44,000. Once you have recorded it in the purchase columns, just copy paste it in the balance. So 4,000 units are purchased, being purchased now. 11, 44,000. Next transaction is again of a purchase. So we record, write the date, 7th, we are buying 7,000 units. Each unit is purchased for 12. It's going to be 84,000. Copy paste here, 7,000 units purchased at the rate of 12, total value 84,000. Now the next transaction is of a sale, if you look at this. And here we are going to apply first in first out method. So before we record sales, it is recommended that we draw a line here. And please understand under first in first out method, our priority of selling our stock is like this. We want to sell from here, then here, and if there is a need from here. Always remember the stock which are on the top, these are the older stock, and these are the recent latest stock. We want to sell from here, then here, then here. So let's see, uh, on 10th, how many units are we selling? We are selling 6,000 units. So this is how I'm going to sell. 1,000 from here, 4,000 from here, that makes five, and 1,000 from here. So writing the date here, 10th of January, I'm selling 6,000, so I go stepwise. First I take 1,000 units, take the same cost, it will be 10,000, then 4,000 units, take the rate, 11, 44, and one and four makes five, I want to sell six, so 1,000 remaining I'm taking from here, which is for 12, that will be 12,000. Now once I've recorded the sale transaction, I need to update my balance. The balance of my stock. This is, you can take it as a storeroom. So this 1,000 units, this 1,000 units have been sold, so they are gone. This 4,000 units have been sold, they are gone. From 7,000, I've sold 1,000. So how many units are left now? 6,000 units. The rate is 12, 72,000. Next transaction is of a purchase. So let's record purchase. 15th, I'm recording purchase, 9,000 units. Each unit is for $15. You multiply, you get 135,000. Whenever you record a purchase, copy paste that into the storeroom, the balance, 9,000 units at the rate of 15, 135,000. Now, again, there is a sale. Whenever there is a sale, we apply first in, first out. So before sale, as I said, it is recommended that we draw a line here. And whenever I'm selling, if it is first in, first out, this is how I'm going to sell. I want to sell from here, and if there is a need, from here as well. But I always start from the top, and I go down, selling. So how many units I'm selling now? 10,000 units. So I'm writing the date, 30th of the month. 10,000 units, so first I'll take the 6,000 units. In the issued sold column, I'm writing 6,000 units. The rate is 12, which is 72,000. I need to sell 10. I've taken six from here. Another four I will take from these 9,000 units. So 4,000 units, the rate is 15. You'll get 60,000 here. So six and four, I've sold 10. Six from here, four from here. Now what is the status of my stock? These 6,000 units have been sold, so they are gone. From 9,000 I've sold four. How many I'm left with? 5,000 units. The rate is 15. You multiply, you get 75,000. 
And finally, just bring this 5,000 down and bring this 75,000 down. This is in dollars, 75,000. And you can write here this happens to be your value of closing stock. 5,000 units and their value, $75,000. So you must have seen in many questions, you get closing stock is valued at 40,000. Closing stock is valued at 55,000. How do you get that value? This is how you get the value of closing stock, which you use in your statement of financial position under current assets, closing stock, ending inventory. You also use this in your statement of comprehensive income when you are calculating cost of goods sold. Remember opening stock, add purchases, minus closing stock. This is the value you minus as closing stock. I hope uh, you have understood the first and first out method. Now we are going to do the second method which is known as last in first out. Same question, but this working will be as per last in first out. What is last in first out? As the name suggests, last in means items which we are buying recently, we are going to sell them first. And the stock which is already lying in the warehouse, we will not sell them. Our preference is at the time of selling, our preference is to sell the recent stock. Now the question is why? The oldest stock we will try to keep with us for some time so that we can sell it at a higher price. The best example is, you know, businesses which are dealing with antiques. The older, the higher price. The vintage car, the older model, the classic cars, sells at a very high price. If you're dealing with durables in times of rising prices, so whatever I purchase today, if I keep it for some time in anticipation of rising prices, yes, later on I can sell it at a higher price. So what we purchase today, we sell them. The older stock we keep so that we can sell it at a higher price. Although IS2 inventories does normally does not recommend a use of last in first out but there are certain businesses which are still using it and academically we need to know how it works out so have a look at the same question but now i'm going to do it with last in first out under perpetual system under perpetual system we draw all these lines the columns periodic system it's done differently we'll talk about that too so I'm taking the inventory January 1st. Inventory, as you know, we write in the last column balance, 1,000 units at the rate of 10. You multiply, you get 10,000. Next transaction is that of a purchase. So I'm writing the date. I'm writing 4,000 units at the rate of 11. Multiply, you get 44,000. Whenever you record purchases, take it in your balance column also. So I'm writing here 4,000 at the rate of 11, 44,000. Next, again, there is a purchase on 7th, 7,000 units at the rate of 12. That gives me 84. When I multiply, copy pasting it in the balance, 7,000 at the rate of 12, 84,000. Draw a line. Why? Because next transaction is of a sale. We are selling 6,000 units. But which method are we talking about? Last in, first out. It is the sale when we, we really have to be very you know, careful. Last in, first out would mean we start selling like this, in this order. We would like to sell from here. If there is a need, I'll sell from the, here and from here as well. But this is how I should go selling. First, I need to get rid of this stock, then this stock, the older ones in the end. That's last and first out. So, how many units I'm selling? 6,000. So, writing the date here, 10th of January. 
6,000 units are be sold. I want to sell from here. Do I have enough 6,000 units? Yes. So I'm taking 6,000 units here at the rate of 12. That is 72,000. I've sold all 6,000 units. Now what is important is the status of stock after sale. I've sold 6,000 units. What is happening to my stock now? Now if you look at, I have sold this 6,000 units from here. Did I touch this stock? Did I sell this? No. So I have to bring them down in the same order, in the same sequence. 1,000, it's very much there. 4,000 is very much there, not sold, still available. From the 7, I sold 6. So from this, 1,000 is left, which is 12, 12,000. Normally, people make mistakes. What they do, they write this one on top and this one down. So that changes the order. That makes the oldest stock new and the new stock old, which should not be done. All right, next what is happening? 15th, we are purchasing again. So 15th, how many units? We are buying 9,000 units at the rate of 15. That gives us 135,000. As soon as I record purchases, I have to take it to the balance column. Copy paste it. 9,000 units at the rate of 15. And that's 135,000. Draw a line because the next transaction is of a sale. So finally, I'm on here on the 30th of January. I'm selling 10,000 units. So 30th of January, the date. And remember, this is last and first out method. This is how I'm going to sell. I need to sell from here. If there is a need from here, and this is how I go up, selling. So 10,000 units. First, I need to get rid of this 9,000 units. So I write 9,000, take the rate 15, it's 135,000. How many units I need to sell? 10,000. So 9,000 from here, 1,000 from here. At the rate of 12, that is 12,000. So 9 and 1, 10,000 has already been sold. What is the position in my stock room? The balance. Look, this 1000 is very much there. I have not sold these ones. So it is there. This 4000 is also there at the rate of 11, 44. But these two have been sold. So they are not there. So in the end, what I'm doing, I'm just drawing a line here. Adding these two, 5,000, adding these two amounts, which is 54,000. And this is my value of closing stock. 5,000 units and the value 54,000 in terms of dollars. So guys, something very important, whether it be last in first out or whether it be first in first out method. In the end, the quantity will be the same, 5,000 units. But the amount will be different. And that's the beauty of the method. Now I'm going to the third and the last method, average costing. Same question will be solved using average costing. And that's kind of different from these two methods. So the third and the final method under perpetual system is average costing. Short form is AVCO. Or you can call it average costing perpetual. In certain books, it is known as uh, moving average perpetual. Same questions. And let me tell you, average costing is completely different from first in, first out, and last in, first out. FIFO and LIFO. Number one, we need to know what is average costing? When it is used? Average costing is used when the price of our goods fluctuates very fast. If you're dealing in currencies, if you're dealing in, you know, gold ornaments, uh, commodities, the price fluctuates a lot. 
For example, if I'm working in, you know, a currency exchange company. So, you know, the value, the exchange rates of different currency, they fluctuate so, so much and so often. There, we used average costing. So if I am a company who has purchased dollar during the day at three different rates, so what is the cost of one dollar? I will look at the average cost. So if uh, I look at the same example here, inventory, as usual, 1,000 units, I'm putting it here. At the rate of 10, multiply by, you get 10,000. After this, you have to draw a line here. In average costing, after every transaction, you have to draw a horizontal line to make sure you don't make mistake, okay? Now, next, we are buying. We are buying how many units? We are buying 4,000 units. At the rate of 11, we get 44. Now, what happens here? When we have purchased, now I'm going to add quantity with quantity, which means 1,000 units I already had, 4,000 units I purchased recently. So in my store, how many units in total do I have? 5,000 units now. 10,000 worth of stock was already there. I further purchased stock worth 44,000. So what is the total value of my stock? 44 plus 10, 54,000. Now I'm, what I'm going to do is, this 54,000, I divide by 5,000 units to get my average price. I think it will be 10.8, just to check. 54,000 divided by 5,000. Yeah, it's 10.8. So this is how I get my average cost. 10.8. All right, let's draw a line here. Next transaction is again a purchase. On 7th, I'm buying 7,000 units. At the rate of 12, that gives me 84. Same procedure, add units with units, cost with cost. So 5,000 and 7,000 gives me 12,000 units. 54,000 and 84,000 gives me 138,000. And now this 138,000, when I divide by 12,000, I get 11.5. 138,000 divided by 12,000. 11.5 is my average cost. Draw a line. Next, what is happening? We are selling 6,000. So if you look at here, all the units are combined. There is nothing like old or new. They're all mixed. So I'm going to sell 6,000 units and I'm going to sell from these 12,000. So, on the 10th, I'm selling 6,000 units, going to take the average price of 11.5. So, 11.5 into 6,000 is going to give me 69,000. Okay. Now what? From 12,000 units, I've sold 6,000 units. How many units are left? Yes, 6,000 units are left. What is their cost? 11.5. You multiply, you get again 69,000. Transaction recorded. Next, I'm buying on 15, 9,000 units. At the rate of 15, you multiply, you get 135,000. Same procedure. Add units with units, amounts with amounts. So 6,000 units and a further 9,000 units will give me a total of 15,000 units. 135,000 plus 69,000, if we add, gives me 204,000. Now this 204,000, if I divide by 15,000, I get 13.6. This is my average cost of one unit. Finally, I'm selling, I'm here on 30th, I'm selling 10,000. And these are the available units. From this 15,000, I'm going to sell 10,000 units. The rate is 13.6. When I multiply, I get 136,000. 
So from 15,000, I sold 10,000 units. I'm left with how many? I'm left with 5,000 units. So this 5,000 unit comes here. Take the rate 13.6 and you multiply. 13.6 into 5,000 gives me 68,000. Finally, bring this down 5,000 and 68,000. This is my value of closing stock. So if you notice, whether it be first in first out, last in first out or average costing, the number of units left at the end is 5000. But the value is different. Why? Because the method is different. Now finally, we are moving on to periodic system. This was perpetual system. I've done the three, you know, uh, calculations of value of closing stock. Before we go to periodic system, understand if you are asked to calculate cost of goods sold under any of this system, whether it be average costing, first in first out, last in first out, how to calculate cost of goods sold. It's pretty simple. Have a look at this. You know this column this issued, the total column of issued. If you add these two, this will be your cost of goods sold. Because if you notice in this entire calculation, we never took the selling prices. Because this whole calculation is done on cost basis. Selling price is to be used by the sales department, not by the stores, the inventory. Okay? So, if you're asked to calculate cost of goods sold, whether it be average costing, last in first out, first in first out, all you have to do is look at this issued, sold, the total column, just vertically total it. So if you add this 136 and 69, you will get your cost of goods sold. If you're asked to calculate profit, very simple. We know from sales, if we minus cost of goods sold, Whatever is sale, we minus cost of goods sold, we will get gross profit. So cost of goods sold, you add these two. For sales, what you need to do is, look at the sales. You have sales on 10th and 30th. 6,000 units multiply by 50. 10,000 units multiply by 50. When you add all these up, you will get the value of sales. When you add these two, you get cost of goods sold. So sales minus cost of goods sold will give you gross profit. And the same calculation applies whether it be average costing, last in first out or first in first out. Guys, let's move on to periodic system. So now we are talking about periodic system and the three methods in it. How to calculate value of closing stock under periodic system. What I've done is I've just uh, you know, written few things here to save time. The question is the same. All I have done is I have taken the beginning inventory. Other than sales, I have recorded everything down. So beginning inventory purchased on the 5th, the 7th, the 15th. Beginning inventory purchased on the 5th, 7th and 15th. So total units available is how much? I added all these. So including the beginning inventory and all the purchases, total available units we have is 21. If you look at the question I've highlighted already, we are selling 6,000 and 10,000. A total of 16,000 units have been sold during the whole month. So if we had total 21,000 units available for sale and 16 has been sold, so how many units are left? 5,000. So under periodic system, first of all, we need to know how many units are left. This information is given to you in your question. Either they'll tell you 5,000 units were left at the end of the year, or you have to work out this way. Opening inventory, add all the purchases, minus units sold, you will get units left. Now we are talking about the first method, which is first in, first out under periodic system. Now, 
this much is clear that we have 5000 units left. Another important thing you need to remember in perpetual system if you remember when we used to sell we used to sell like this from top these we used to sell so if it is first in first out I have started selling from top these 5000 units which are left have to be from here because all those on top has been sold because in the first in first out our priority is to sell the oldest stock first so if it is first in first out our assumption is that all these units from top has been sold so whatever is left has to be from these units how many units are left we have already calculated that 5000 that means 5000 are left from here so I can write like this from 15th January purchases 5000 units are left and obviously if it is from 15th January the rate is 15 so 5000 multiplied by dollar 15 that will give me 75,000 and this is the value of my closing stock that's it periodic system is this short no long calculations, no columns, not that table, nothing has to be drawn. Simple concept has to be used. How many units are left? What is our selling priority? This is how we start selling. So if 5,000 units are left, all these are sold, it got to be from here. Likewise, if I talk about last in first out, one thing is clear that 5,000 units are left. And obviously, in last in first out, this is how I start selling. This is my priority. So if 5,000 units are left, I've been selling like this. So the ones which are left have to be from top. How many? Five. That means this would be left. And this would also be there because they add up to five. Remaining from here has been sold. Because in last in first out, this is how we sell. So we sell from here and the older ones are left. So this is left. So I can write from January, from January 1000, January 1st, 1000 units. Each unit has a cost of 10, that makes 10,000. And how many units are left? 5,000. From here you have sold, so 1 and 4 are left. So I can write from January 5th, 4,000 units. And the rate is 11, so you multiply, you get 44,000. Add them up, this is 54,000. This is the value of closing stock or ending inventory, whatever you call it. So under last and first out is 54, under first and first out it's 75. And let's talk about the last one, which is average costing. Now in average costing, what I'm going to do is, all these beginning inventory and all the purchases, I'm going to multiply these units with the price, the unit with the cost of these. Okay, so let's do it here. Average costing. So save time, I'm going to be a little quick. I've told you what I'm going to do. I'm just multiplying the number of units with their cost. So January 1st, 1000 units. You multiply by the cost 10, which will give you 10,000. Then we have 4000 units. Multiply by 11, that gives you 44. Then we have 7,000 units. Multiply by 12, that gives you 84. Then we have 9,000 units. Multiply by 15, that gives you 135. You add all the number of units, which obviously would be 21,000. We have done it here. And add this cost. 
So just to make sure, 54, 84, and 135. This gives me 273,000. 273,000. So now it's simple mathematics. 273,000 is the total cost. 21,000 units are there. So let's divide 273 divided by 21,000. We will get average cost per unit. Average cost per unit 273,000 divided by 21,000 units so you'll get $13 this is the average cost of one unit but please keep in mind we have to calculate the value of closing stock we have 5,000 units left so value of closing stock would be Five thousand units multiply by the average cost of one unit, which is thirteen. You multiply whatever you get. That is the value of your closing stock. I hope you guys have understood this. So, in today's lecture, what we have covered is we have covered what is inventory, what are inventory valuation systems the comparison between periodic and perpetual we have discussed all the three methods of inventory valuation under perpetual and periodic as you can see here these are all periodic perpetual i've done it before so guys i hope you have understood the concept of inventory valuation the inventory valuation systems the methods so if you are not uh, subscribed to my channel yet please subscribe my channel press the bell icon if you like the content, you know, give me a thumbs up. And as I always say, please leave a comment down in the description here. We have a comment section. Leave your comment. Let me know how you have found this lecture. If there are any suggestions in your comment, you also write your demands, what topics you want me to make my next videos on. And you know, I won't disappoint you. And if you like the video, please share it with your friends so that others can also benefit. Thank you so very much for your precious time.